Shalom guys, welcome back to another episode here at the Shadow Dream Ministry for the Casa de Israel. Thank you again for being there. Uh, we'll continue with the weekly Torah portion uh, in the book of uh, Shemot, Exodus. We are in Torah portion Tetzave. And so um, we'll continue the process of the building of the tabernacle. Uh, last week we started with the Teruma offering um, to start... Uh, bringing the materials uh, to uh, build the tabernacle, the instructions of the, the first couple of elements. Um, and this offering had to come from the heart. Um, and the ones that will be building the tabernacle will be building the tabernacle uh, from their hearts and filled with the spirit of God and God's word and instructions. And so here is God starting to give Israel the blueprint of what he desires uh, and he says that his desire is to dwell among his people and so uh, we will be focusing on elements uh, this year this cycle we'll be focusing on the uh, first portion of the Torah portion which is the olives uh, olive oil um, for the menorah uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about it uh, we're gonna focus on that and uh, last two years, we've spoken a little bit about the priesthood. Um, obviously, uh, we're doing our best to start, start to get diving into more details. So we'll focus on the oil uh, this year. Um, so before we get started, like I was saying, let's do a tour blessing. Bless Adonai who's blessed, bless Adonai who's blessed now and forever, bless are you Adonai God, sovereign of the universe, who has chosen us from among the peoples and given us the Torah, blessed are you Adonai, giver of the Torah, amen. So, like I said, this week's Torah portion is Tetzaveh. Uh, and is in Exodus 27, verse 20 to Exodus 30, verse 10. The Haftarah portion of the prophet's portion is Ezekiel, chapter 43, verse 10 to 27. And the Brit Chalashah portion, or the New Testament portion, is uh, Hebrews 13, verses 10 through 16. Last week's Torah portion, Terumah explained that God had asked for a donation from the people for the sake of creating a profitable tent-like sanctuary called the Tabernacle. God then showed Moses the pattern according to which the tabernacle and its furnishings were to be made. First, the Ark of the Covenant and its cover called the Kaporet would occupy the inner chamber called the Holy of Holies. Within it, an adjoining chamber called the Holy Place, a table would hold 12 loaves of matzah and seven branch menorah would illuminate the tent. God gave precise dimensions of t the tent with added instructions to separate the Holy of Holies by a veil and called a parchet. The entire tent was to have a wooden frame covered by colored fabric and the hide of rams and goats. Outside the tent, the outer court was defined that would include a copper sacrificial altar and water basin. The outer court was to be enclosed by a fence made with fine linen on silver poles with hooks of silver and sockets of brass. And this week's tour portion Tetzaveh continues the description of the tabernacle, though the focus shifts to those who will serve in it, namely the Kohanim. First, Moses was instructed to tell the Israelites to bring pure oil, olive oil, for the lamps of the menorah, which the high priest was to light every evening in the holy place. Next, God commanded Moses to ordain Aaron and his sons as priests and describe their priestly garments they would wear while serving in the tabernacle. Um, we're starting to learn about elements and parts of what uh, God designs or requires to design the tabernacle and its furnishings and those who will serve in it. Obviously, in Leviticus, we'll start seeing how they will put these elements into action, whether it be the oil, uh, the anointing, etc., uh, etc., et and obviously the priesthood, how will they manifest their function and their duties and here we're just starting to learn about the elements um, for their essence okay so this week's story portion starts the following way we at we at the et 
בני ישראל, ויחו אליך שמן זית זך חטית למאור לחעלות נר תמיד. And in English it says the following. Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil, press olives for the light, so that the lamps may be kept burning in the tent of meeting outside the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant Law. Aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before the Lord from evening till morning. This is to be a lasting ordinance among the Israelites for the generations to come. Rambam, which is a very famous uh, rabbi who uh, a common, common, is a commentator on, uh, on, on these matters of the Torah, points out that the frequently used formula they shall make would be inappropriate here because they had no facilities in the wilderness for acquiring olives or extracting the oil. So he says oil had to be brought in its prepared state. Hence, it was to be brought to Moses for inspection as to its quality. The oil was either included among the supplies carried from Egypt or was acquired in the wilderness from caravaners. Okay, so this is his opinion on how would they be able to fulfill this because they're in a desert, so there's no olive trees and that they can pick from, etc., etc. And so, the clear oil being olives, the oil listed in chapter uh, 25, verse 6 of last week, like the other items mentioned there, refers to a one-time donation for making the tabernacle, okay? But the present prescription, like command and mandate, it, is an ongoing obligation, meaning the service of the menorah, of maintaining it uh, lit, uh, is something that the Kohanim, um, Aaron and his sons will have to focus and maintain uh, uh, as consistent. Oil extracted from olives is specified because several other sources of oil, including sesame seed, flax, and animal fats, were utilized in ancient Near East. So the oil used for the tabernacle lamps had to be clear, zach, that is refined so as to be free of leaves. This condition, which at least is more like a um, like a yeast type uh, element, this condition was obtained by pounding the olives in a mortar with a uh, pestle rather than by grinding grinding the in in a meal. Hence, Hebrew katit beatent. The oil was then passed through a strainer, resulting in a clear, refined grade that yields a far brighter light and produces a minimum smoke when Obviously, the lamps are um, uh, uh, prepared and lit, so it's interesting. Now, we will read from the Mishnah tractate, because obviously we have the commands of God in, uh, in the Torah, but obviously, as time went on, um, leaders were able to register, based on the first and second temples, how the service of how these olives were continuously brought so that they can be continuously uh, prepared so that they can continuously have olives in the land, of course, um, to do this, right? Because God is very specific. They have to be clear, clean. And so how would they do this? How would they inspect this? Uh, we're going to read this in uh, Mishnah Menachot, chapter 8. It says here, there are three harvests of olives each year, and in each of them, three different grades of oils are produced. So, how is the first olive harvest processed? So, one picks the rip ripe uh, olives at the top of the olive tree, uh, as those are the first to ribbon, and crushes them in a mortar and places them inside a bottom of a wicker basket that has many small holes in it. The oil will then drip from the olives through those holes into a vessel placed underneath the basket. Rabbi Yehuda uh, commentates and says, One position, the olives on the walls surrounding the basket. This produces more refined oil as, to, uh, as the dregs stick uh, to the walls of the basket. This is the first grade of oil produced from the first harvest. After the oil ceases to seep from the crushed olives, one then presses down with a wooden beam upon them, causing additional oil to flow from the basket into the vessel. And so this first ripe 
of the olive. This oil is the most purest one that is taken for the service of the lighting of the menorah. Okay, <clears throat> now Menachot 8, a little bit farther down, says the, those olives that to extract uh, any remaining oil, this is the third, so it starts describing the first grade of oil, which is the one that is used for the menorah, and then the second and third grade, right? So then he says, the first grade is fit for kindling the candela candelabrum, which requires refined oil, right? The rest are fit for the use of meal offering. So the oil is used for many things. As one of the most highly valued and useful trees known to the ancient Jews, the olive tree is significant for several reasons in the Bible. Its importance in Israel is expressed in the parable of Jonathan in Judges chapter 9, verses 8 through 9, which it says, One day the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves. They said to the olive tree, Be our king. But the olive tree answered, Shall I give up my oil? by which both gods and humans are honored to hold sway over the trees. And so, obviously, uh, this is pointing to the uh, function of the oil, the olive oil, that is used for the anointing of the kings and priests. Okay? And anointing is a sign of separation and dedication for service. Okay? So, rather common in the Holy Land, the olive tree is a multiple branch evergreen, with a knotted trunk, smooth ash-colored bark, and oblong leathery leaves that are silvery green. Mature, cultivated olive trees grow to 20 feet or more in height and produce small flowers, yellow and white, around the 1st of, of May. When the blooms begin to fall olives, the fruit of the tree starts to form. Okay, At first, the fruit is green, but turns into a deep blue, black, or dark green color. When the olives are fully ripened and harvested in early fall. So, in the ancient Near East, olive trees were an essential source of food. As we are also given an example in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 25. Uh, and lamp oil, which is something that we're reading right now with Exodus uh, 27, verse 20. And medicine in Isaiah chapter 1, 6 and Luke 10, 34. We see references to that. Anointing oil, which is... Uh, and you can see a reference to that in First Samuel chapter ten, verses one to, uh, to, and also in Second Kings chapter nine and three, and sacrificial oil, which we will see in Leviticus two, uh, verses four, and Genesis twenty-eight verse uh, twenty uh, eighteen, and uh, wood for furniture. Okay, so these are references of how many ways these oils and olives and the trees are used. And, and the representation and the importance of this element in the Bible. The olive tree and the olive branch have been symbols of peace and reconciliation ever since the account of Noah's flood, which is interesting. When the dove brought Noah a plucked olive leaf in its beak, the olive branch represented a new life sprouting on the earth. The flowering olive tree is a symbol of beauty and abundance in the Bible. The tree's fruitfulness and ability to thrive suggests that the model of righteous, uh, of, of the model of a righteous person, which is hinted in Psalms uh, 52 verse 8 and Hosea uh, chapter 14 verse 6, whose children are described as vigorous young olive trees. Also in Psalms 128 verse 3, olive oil was also used in the anointing and coronation of kings, making it an, an emblem of sovereignty. Okay, so in Jeremiah 11, verse 16, right, in the prophets, we see an occasion where Jeremiah, God speaks to, obviously, to the prophet and tells Israel, uh, the Lord once called you an, a green olive tree, beautiful with good fruit. And so, obviously, this is God telling them that I called you this before, but because you have sinned, I will cast you into fire and I will cut you off. Right, but it's interesting that in the most um, beautiful and uh, important way that resembles or um, describes Israel as an olive tree. Okay, so it's very important this element of uh, of the olive in, in in scripture. Okay, it says again, I asked, did this, did they stumble 
uh, as to fall beyond recovery. So this is Paul in Romans 11, verses 11 through 17. It says, again, I ask, did they stumble as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? <clears throat> I'm talking to the Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am apostle of the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that my that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what would their acceptance be uh, but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered in the first fruit is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoe, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishment uh, sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. And so, um, here the references from the olive from the standpoint of it being offered for the service of the menorah, the kindling light oil pure to maintain uh, that uh, lit uh, wick of the candle, uh, expands to the anointing oil of the priest and the king. But also, the tree itself and the fruit of it is represented also by Israel and is also represented by those that are grafted in, right? Which is interesting, like that process of ripping the first fruits of the olive and that first press of oil, which is like the best that you can give, is given for that menorah to be lit continually right and so those symbolisms of Yeshua saying you're the light of the world right a light that is top the put on top of a hill cannot be hidden or you don't put a lamp under a table you put it on top of a table so it can shine forward in front of men right the oil that is put in those lamp is what maintains it lit continuously Right? And we also say that the Torah is uh, a light to our feet, a candle to our feet. Right? And so um, the olive can also be represented as us right? and our fruit, our first intention, our first desire, our most uh, uh, pure effort in service. We give it to God. Right? In the process of learning his Torah or his instructions, which is light to our feet. If we become that oil, we're able to burn bright that candle, which lights others uh, in the way of God's purpose and mission and mission and message of the kingdom to come. And so <clears throat> the essence of the olive oil, the pure essence of it and the first ripe of that fruit. We can learn so much about giving our best and our purest intention in the service of God. And if we can be that olive that gives a pure fruit or a pure um, and clear intention to kindle God's fire, God's menorah, God's um, light to the world. He will shine bright and will bring light to darkness. It will bring order to chaos. And so that is just us studying the first couple of verses of um, this week's Torah portion. Obviously, it continues with the consecration of Aaron and the priests and their garments. And we can also learn so many things about that. Um, and so... Uh, we will continue with that next cycle, and probably I'll discuss a little bit with my youth in class. So, uh, I hope you guys learned something new. If you didn't, 
uh, if you reviewed, if you already know this, then hey, I just, I know what I know. I uh, thank you for listening. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Like and subscribe. Uh, and Shavuotov and Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.